Good morning, everybody. We're live from the bird house. And today we're talking about some of the other migratory birds that are coming into the area. And of course, showing your photos. You guys have been sending in some really neat photos of different things around town. Um, here today at the bird house, we also have a plant sale going on. We've got Michael Hainan here. He will be here from 10 till 3 with a big selection of plants. So if you're sprucing up your garden and looking for some new things, stop on in today. He's got a whole bunch of different things for sale. So that's going on here today also. If you have any questions or comments, you can absolutely put those in the comments. And of course, we always love to know what kind of things you're seeing. Um, I know in my yard right now, the feeders are just going crazy. There's The birds are so, so hungry. And then I think the thing getting the most attention is the nesting ball. I've got birds that are just tearing this nesting material out here um, at a really rapid pace. So that's really fun if you haven't tried the nesting balls. Um, it's all natural cotton and the birds will just perch on here and just pull the cotton out to line their nests. So that's a lot of fun. So you want to make sure that you don't put out any kind of dryer lint for nesting material. Uh, so it's just not known if the chemicals and the detergents can harm birds in any way. So you want to stay away from that. But you can also use pet fur. So um, if you have like an empty suet cage or something like that, you can always stuff it with pet fur. Um, birds will use that, like tufted tit mice especially will use pet fur to, um, to line their nests and to help build their nests. So that's something you can always do as well. Um, let's get started here. And as we do, I like to look at the migration map all the time to see what the migratory activity has been. There were a few days where it was kind of dark and there wasn't all too much going on. But as we've been going on uh, every day, there's been more and more activity here in upstate New York in our area. So if you still haven't seen any Orioles or hummingbirds in your yard, don't be too, too uh, surprised about that. It seems like they are um, not showing up in the numbers that they have been previously. So people are reporting Orioles, but they haven't been reporting them in the, the large, large numbers that they usually do. So I'm wondering if they're just a little delayed. Um, although we got them around the same time we always do, um, they're just not in that, that large number yet. So don't get discouraged. If you haven't been seeing lots of Orioles, keep the feeder clean the food fresh and the nectar fresh and the jelly fresh and um, you might you just might have some luck still i know i only had one or two orioles so far and i haven't seen mine in almost a week so they're definitely out there you guys have been sending in your photos of them um, but if you haven't had a large number yet don't be super surprised but people are reporting them and the hummingbirds coming back to their yards in general so um for a while the migration activity was really high in the uh, middle of the country here, and it still is. Uh, but you can see for a while it was it was really kind of like dark purple in our area, and it was starting to slowly get pink. And now we're we're into a better. Uh, you know, a better time for migration right now. So it's still happening. There's still birds flowing through. And uh, this is the map showing what the predicted migration is tonight going into tomorrow, because a lot of these birds do migrate overnight. So um, tomorrow could be a really good day for birding. There's millions of birds that are flowing through the area. So just to kind of show you. Then uh, the night of the 16th, it's not going to be as much migration activity. So you can see uh, how it can change day to day. So looks like tomorrow will be a good day to go out birding if you're in the upstate New York area. And I had a pretty great exciting sighting last Saturday a week ago came home from working and what was in my backyard but an eastern towhee. I've never had an eastern towhee in my backyard so that was really exciting. Um, so here's a photo of a photo of the <laughs> of the eastern towhee I had and this looks like a female because she's kind of lighter in color. The males tend to be darker like a black uh, and she was kind of a dark brown with chestnut um, coloring on her sides. So that was a really, really fun sighting for me. There was the Eastern Tohi. And I know most of you should be familiar with American Robin because they are quite common, um, but there are different types of birds that are in that same family, the thrush family that have been flowing into the area and people are starting to see more and more of. So I thought I would show you some of those. Um, the first, is the wood thrush. So 
a lot of these birds will have will be in the same kind of um, habitat as a, as a robin would. Um, they but the a lot of the thrushes do like kind of a more a wooded area. So whereas a robin, you might see kind of at the edge of the woods, not deep deep in the woods. A lot of these thrushes you'll find in the um, kind of in in the deeper parts of the woods. And the wood thrush is my personal favorite of the thrush family because I love its song. It has a really neat song. I'll play that for you here. So this is something you can sometimes hear echoing through the forest. It's kind of a rattly, a little rattle call. So pretty cool sound. Um, so that is the wood thrush. So keep an eye out for them in the woods. And they've got a really kind of dark speckling on their breast here. Um, then the hermit thrush is probably going to be the more common um, of the two, of the uh, wood thrush and hermit thrush. They tend to be a little lighter in color, and they don't have as many polka dots there on their breast. And then they also will have kind of a reddish tail, which can be kind of hard to see uh, depending on your view of it. But the hermit thrush um, you can find uh, in the woods as well. So keep an eye out for them. And then there's also one called a viri, and uh, they don't have as much speckling on them at all. They're kind of more of a really light tan color. And uh, again, you can find those in the woods. So pretty cool. Um, some different birds that you can find now in the area as far as thrushes go. And then there are, uh, there have been sightings of this bird here. This is called a Virginia rail. So if you're spending any time birding and you're out by the, uh, any kind of marsh or wetland, keep an eye out for this bird here because they're, they have been spotted in several places around town. So this is the Virginia rail. Keep an eye out for them. Pretty cool little bird there. And then vireos. There's little birds called vireos. We've talked on Tuesday about warblers, all the different types of warblers around. There's also these different types of birds called vireos, and we have a few species you can find here now. There's the red-eyed vireo, which gets its name because it does have that bright red eye. Um, there is a yellow-throated vireo, which is this bird up on the top, which looks a lot like a pine warbler um, to me, but it does have a a thicker bill than the pine warbler would. So it looks quite a bit like a pine warbler, I think. Um, but the bill is going the blue headed vireo. And then there's the Philadelphia and the warbling vireo. So a um, bunch of different species you can find there uh, here now. And they tend to sing a lot. So if you're using that Merlin sound ID, um, these birds, you might not see them because they tend to be kind of high up in trees, but they sing and sing and sing. So uh, keep your ear out for the different types of vireos that we have in the area. And as we've been going along in the season, we've talked about different shorebirds that are out there. We talked about killdeer. Some people were getting killdeer even in their their, their driveways or in their yards, especially if it's new development where there's not a lot of grass and there's not a lot of plants. If it's, you know, a lot of gravel, that's where you can find killdeer. They're a type of shorebird though, so you can also find them by the water. Um, so we've talked about killdeer early on in the season. We talked about American woodcock, uh, but then there's some other birds you can find by the water, some different shore birds. Um, there's been lots of reports of spotted sandpiper. So if you are by any kind of uh, mud flats or any kind of habitat like that, where there's low levels of water with some exposed mud, look for some different types of shorebirds like this one here. And like its name suggests, it has lots of spots on it. And then there's also one called a solitary sandpiper. And sometimes you can find these together. Um, the spotted sandpiper, they tend to be more in groups. Um, and then they bob their tail a lot when they're moving. So that's one way to identify them. Solitary sandpiper tend to be solitary, uh, but sometimes they'll be wing with the, um, the spotted sandpiper. So um, so pretty cool different types of birds that are out there. And some sightings you guys have sent in. Um, this is the Eastern Meadowlark and Bob sent this photo in. He said, really surprising sighting this morning. Two Eastern Meadowlarks flew into a neighbor's tree. So happy I was able to see them. So this is a really cool 
uh, a really, really cool sighting. Eastern meadowlarks have been getting more and more rare. Um, they are a, a grassland species, so they do like wide open areas of tall grass, which is a habitat that is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And so are the populations of the Eastern meadowlark. So this was a really neat sighting sent in by Bob. He says, when you are surprised by a couple of early morning visitors to Eastern meadowlarks, I thought I was seeing one uh, or I thought seeing one was crazy, but seeing two just made my day. This is from three or four days ago. So Bob's been seeing an Eastern meadowlark. Really neat sighting there. Something that we rarely get reports of uh, people seeing when they're out birding. So really, really neat photos there sent in by Bob who had the Eastern Meadowlark. And another photo he sent in, he said in the you just never know category. In his bird bath, he had um, a hawk. And I know he's been getting a sharp shinned hawk, which is what I think this one is here, uh, coming to his yard quite a bit. And here it is in the bird bath. And uh, every once in a while, we'll get a hawk in the bird bath behind the store. We usually get a um, a red-tailed hawk that'll plop in the bird bath, which is pretty funny. So you just never know what might come to your water feature in your backyard, which is pretty cool. And we've got an update about the Carolina wrens. Ed sent in these photos uh, maybe a week or more ago of the Carolina wrens that had their chicks. And uh, the parents were bringing the food to them pretty readily. I love this photo here of all them with their mouths wide open. So they've grown. <laughs> so this is a photo from well, maybe a week or a uh, week or more ago. Um, it's got to be of the babies and this is them now. So this is the, the the chick there. So it doesn't take very long for them to really grow. Uh, so Ed says, quite the day today. Our five Carolina Wren chicks all fledged this morning while we watched from the garage 30 feet away. Mom came by to feed the last one out of the nest and then it became anxious to follow its siblings. On its first flight, this last little guy landed on a stump in the garden and from there it flew to the rhododendron where the other fledglings were. All the other siblings then flew into a big pile of sticks out in the wood pile. Much to our surprise, the last one out of the rhododendron took a turn, flew right towards me and into my outstretched hand. It was pretty calm, seemed at ease, perching on my fingers, and I felt pretty special like a proud new dad. I took it over to the wood pile and set it down where I had seen the other fledglings. Good luck, little buddy. Stop back anytime. I think I should go get a lotto ticket. So there's a really cool photo here showing the parent feeding the chick. And this looks like the chick, the last one to leave the nest. And here it is flying. That looks like maybe the wood stump there. And then here's a photo of it in the in his hand. So this is so, so cute. I love that stumpy little tail. So <laughs> really cute photos here of the Carolina wren chick. So amazing. It really does not take very long for them to leave that nest. So um, really cool update there on the Carolina wrens. So that's so neat. Um, here is a photo of a rose-breasted grosbeak. We've still been getting reports of those coming to people's yards. This photo was sent in by Randy. It looks like the grosbeak there is going to uh, the suet, the cake. And then also a pileated woodpecker photo that he sent in. So it looks like it's making quick work of that tree stump there. And here's somebody else, uh, Rich sent in photos of another pileated woodpecker going after a tree stump. He said, here are some pictures of a visiting pileated woodpecker. Uh, the video shows him having at an old ash tree stump in our backyard. You don't appreciate how large these birds are until you see them up close. So this is a pileated woodpecker making quick work of a stump. It's amazing. Uh, it doesn't take them very long at all to make wood chips out of any kind of dead or rotting tree. So really, really neat photos there of the pileated woodpecker. And then he also sent in this photo here of one on a suet feeder. And I like this photo because you can show or you can see um, how they use those paddle tails on those suet feeders to kind of prop themselves up while they feed. So really neat photos. It looks like this uh, here is the female. Um, so he's got at least a, a couple different pileated woodpeckers there and you can tell it's a female because she's got black on her face and then the male will have that red stripe there on his face so really neat photos there of the pileated woodpeckers so you guys are seeing lots of those which is really fun 
And then Baltimore Orioles. You guys have been reporting Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Rich says, so happy to have captured some photos of our first Baltimore Oriole visitor. We live near the Penfield Webster border and have had our Oriole feeder out for about a week. So this is the Baltimore Oriole uh, photo sent in by Rich, who's been getting them coming to his feeders. So some really great photos there of the Oriole. And Bob sent in this photo of a hummingbird. He says, first hummingbird of the season for me. So people are starting to get their hummingbirds coming back to their yards as well. So there's the hummingbird photo there. And then great crested flycatcher. You might hear these guys singing if you're out in the woods. Um, this was a photo sent in by Bob, who I believe had great crested flycatcher last year as well. Um, and great crested flycatcher are also a cavity nesting species. So you can find them in the woods nesting in old trees. So they're a pretty large bird, a large flycatcher there. And that is the great crested flycatcher sent in by Bob. That's a great photo right there of the flycatcher. It's got a nice long tail. It's got that kind of yellowish wash on its body. And it does have kind of like a larger head um, that sometimes looks a little squared off like this. So that is your great crested flycatcher. Kind of an unusual, another unusual sighting. And Rich sent in some more photos of birds. He says some of the recent visitors. So it looks like a female bluebird here who's not as brightly colored as the male and a mockingbird. So you might get mockingbirds coming to your suet feeders or sometimes your oriole feeders. They'll eat the jelly or the oranges sometimes. And here's one sitting on his, the, the pole there. So every once in a while, we get people who all have mockingbirds in their backyards. Sometimes they even come to platform feeders. If there's some sunflower hearts in there, they'll eat those as well. So here it is loving the suet. And you can see those white patches on their wings when they fly. They have these bright, bright white patches on their wings that help identify them. So that is your mockingbird. And then white crowned sparrow. So um, I've been seeing some white crowned sparrow and recently a white throated sparrow in my backyard, which is pretty exciting. And looks like Rich has them as well. So this is your white crowned sparrow. Um, it's not going to have that bright colored patch that most white-throated sparrows have, but it is quite large, overall pretty gray, and it has um, those bright black and white stripes on the top of its head. And then another little sparrow, a little chipping sparrow here, they've got, they're going to be smaller than your typical house sparrow, and they've got that chestnut cap on the top of their head and then a black line that goes right through their eye. So that is your chipping sparrow and a purple finch. So really cool to see that um, there's still some purple finch hanging around. And here's a beautiful specimen right here, a male purple finch. Um, Baltimore Orioles, you guys are seeing them as you're out walking and coming to your feeders. Here's a photo of a Baltimore Oriole high up in a tree, send in and here's another one there with it perched on a tree. Here's a picture sent in by Bob of the Baltimore Oriole enjoying some jelly there. And uh, here's one that's perched on the suet. So sometimes they do eat suet. So if you are trying to entice more Orioles, there is orange flavored suet that you can get. Um, so that um, that's one way to to bring in some orioles too sometimes give them a little bit something extra they seem to come to suet early on in the season when they're first migrating in and they're really really hungry so that's um that's another thing that they do eat that we don't really bring up too much but they will eat suet here and there and then some more oriole photos uh he's bob says like two peas in a pod once the oriole arrives it is soon followed by the gray cat bird so I've actually been getting more gray cat birds in my backyard than Orioles so far this season, which is um, too bad, but I do love the gray cat birds and here's one eating the jelly. So they do definitely love the jelly. They're in the same family as the mockingbird. They are a mimicking type of bird. So if you hear some kind of bird singing different songs over and over and over again, could be that you have a gray cat bird. Um, Rose-breasted grosbeaks still being reported. This is a photo actually that I snapped in my backyard with my cell phone of my first rose-breasted grosbeak of the season. There it is on top of my bird feeder pole along with the usual cast of characters, all the sparrows. Um, but then I did have a female house finch in there too. Um, and then I love this 
photo sent in by Tammy. She says, have there been reports of more rose-breasted grosbeaks in the area? We usually see one male and one female every year, but I just had six males outside. And it's kind of hard to tell in the photo, but she did circle each little one in red. <laughs> so she had six males out there all at once. So it seems to have been a pretty good year for rose-breasted grosbeaks. Um, so um, it's hard to say if it's been there have been more reports than usual, but um, there have been a lot of people that have gotten them for the first time this year. So there, there's, there's something to be said there. So, so far it has been a pretty strong season for them. So curious what you guys think if you've had more rose-breasted gross beaks than usual. And uh, here's Tammy with six different rose-breasted gross beaks all at once. So really neat. Uh, here's a Better photo of another rose-breasted grosbeak in my backyard. This is the female here. She hung around for a couple days chowing on safflower. And I haven't seen her back in a while. Well, you guys are still seeing them out and about. Here's another rose-breasted grosbeak male photo sent in by uh, Voitech. And one sent in by Mark, who says, I saw three rose-breasted grosbeaks in my backyard, along with the catbird eating jelly and oranges. So you guys are definitely still seeing Rose-breasted grosbeak speak out there. So really, really fun. And then if you are out birding at all, looking for warblers or what have you, there are still a ton of ruby crown kinglets out there. So you might see them bopping around too. They can be hard to identify sometimes because they're kind of plain, um, but they will sometimes, you can see the red on the top of their head, which helps identify them. So that's the ruby crown kinglet. So they're overall pretty gray. They're small. They hop around in the trees a lot, kind of like a warbler does. So they can be hard to, to, um, to tell what they are, but then they will have a little bit of a yellowish wash on their wings too, but there's a lot of them out there. And brown thrasher, we've been getting reports of people getting brown thrasher in their backyard more so than usual. So um, those are all, all the three mimicking birds people are, are getting in their backyard. So the brown thrasher is a mimic, as is the catbird and the mockingbird. So um, you might be able to get all three of them. You can get the trifecta. Um, they tend to be underneath the feeders eating you know, the leftover seeds and that kind of thing. Um, they're not going to come to the jelly or oranges so much like the catbirds and the mockingbirds do. Um, the brown thrasher is going to be eating more, more seeds and that kind of, that kind of food. And it's definitely warbler time out there. So uh, now is absolutely the time to go out looking for warblers before the leaves really start popping on the trees. Although that's happening very, very quickly. I can't believe that how many leaves the maple trees suddenly have. It seemed like it happened overnight. Um, but warblers are out in mass. We talked on Tuesday about a bunch of the different types you can find, in, at least here in the upstate New York area. And you guys have definitely been seeing them. So here's some photos you guys sent in. Here is the yellow warbler. And I've been hearing a yellow warbler singing in either my backyard or my neighbor's backyard, but it's been chirping away like mad. So they are very, very vocal. They sing and sing and sing. Um, so you don't, you wouldn't be, you shouldn't be too surprised if you do happen to get one in your backyard because they are pretty common and they're easy to spot because they never stop talking. So this is the yellow warbler overall, very, very yellow. And then they'll have this kind of reddish chestnut type of coloration, these streaks on their breast there. So that is your yellow warbler. And then the other one that is quite common is going to be the yellow rumped warbler. And they'll have this yellow patch on their side of their body. They've got some yellow on the top of their head. And then they get their name from this yellow patch that's on their rump there. So yellow rumped warbler is another pretty common warbler to be found. Uh, same with the black and white warbler, and they are going to be found on trees. They tend to crawl up and down trees looking for little bugs. So you might just happen to see them in your backyard. They're kind of easier to spot because they do like to be on the trunks of trees. So they're more eye level than some of these other birds will be. Um, but here's a photo sent in by Mark of a black and white warbler at Cobbs Hill. And some other species you can find, palm warbler. They're going to be overall pretty yellow with a chestnut colored cap on the top of their head. So they've been around. Here's a pine warbler, which looks a lot like that yellow-throated vireo, um, but it's got the thinner bill. 
And one of my favorites, Black Throated Blue Warbler. I think these are just so, so beautiful. Um, this photo, it's a little dark, so it's hard to kind of tell just how blue they are, but these photos sent in by Mark show it's bright, bright, bright blue when it's out in the sun. So this is your Black Throated Blue Warbler. Really, really pretty bird there that you can find here now. And here's a photo of it flying away, the Black Throated Blue Warbler. Um, here is an oven bird. So this is kind of a, a rear shot here of your oven bird, um, but that's kind of how uh, it looks when you're out birding. <laughs> they don't pose for you all the time, just how you'd like them to be. So this is a type of warbler and they tend to be um, found in the woods. So you can find them kind of deeper in the woods um, as opposed to some of these other warblers. Well, you can find them in the woods. Um, a lot of them kind of like that edge habitat in between some open area and some woods, depending on the species. But this oven bird definitely likes to be deeper in the woods. They're going to be kind of an overall brownish, olivish type color, but then they've got this reddish colored streak on the top of their head, and it's surrounded by these two uh, dark colored lines. So there's an oven bird. Uh, Mark also sent in some Vireo pictures. This is a warbling Vireo that he saw, another prolific singer. Um, here's a wood thrush. So wood thrush are definitely out and about, and you can see that it's got those brightly colored, uh, dark, dark, dark polka dots in there. The contrast between the white and the black is is pretty distinct there for the wood thrush. So really, really neat bird to find again in the woods. And a few people have been even getting indigo buntings in their backyard. So most of these birds aren't going to come to feeders like the warblers, um, although there's always exceptions. But the indigo bunting is a bird that you can sometimes get to your feeders. And it's not going to be as common as like an oriole or a grosbeak, but people are getting them. And the thing with the indigo bunting is they do like smaller seeds. So they're going to eat um, something like your sunflower hearts. So if you've got any kind of seed or a blend that has sunflower hearts in it, that is ideal um, because they can have some trouble opening up larger seeds with their beak. So they like sunflower hearts, they'll eat millet, they'll eat niger. So it's going to be those smaller sized seeds, same kind of thing like you'd feed some gold, uh, goldfinch. Um, that's what your indigo bunting is going to come for. So i um, curious if any of you guys have had any indigo buntings in your backyards coming to your feeders. They are just gorgeous, uh, really, really gorgeous bird here. So here's a photo sent in by Mark of some indigo buntings there in Menden Ponds and also some more warblers. This is a chestnut sided warbler and it looks like it's uh, singing a little song here and you can tell that it gets its name from its chestnut sides there so you can see it well in this photo. Um, they'll also have some yellow on the top of their head and then you can see that better right here. So chestnut sided warbler, another really beautiful little migratory bird we've got in the area and then yellow throated vireo. So some more Vireo action coming through. And then a magnolia warbler, really, really beautiful bird there as well. Uh, another warbler species you can find here now is a northern perula. So this, here's a photo here of a northern perula and common yellow throat. So this time of the never know what you might see out there with so many different migrants coming through. So thank you guys for watching. That's a little update of what you can expect to see when you're out birding right now. If you have any questions, um, you can absolutely put those in the comments or if you just want to say hi. Um, Ducasse says, just started on my bird garden. Yep, now is a great time to start thinking of different plants and plantings for the birds, especially hummingbirds. Humming birds love coming to flowers. It seems like um, if they have the choice of a feeder or flowers, they seem to like coming to the flowers, especially later on in the season when there's more things in bloom. Um, right now, with there's some things in bloom, but not a whole bunch of different um, options. They seem to like to come to feeders, especially early in the season. Keith has a question. He says, I have a question regarding tree swallows. I had my first pair ever. They would go to the bird box um, or the bird house multiple times. I could hear little ones in there. They then disappeared and I look in the box. No nest, uh, no nest. Is that normal? 
Side note, three males and one female oriole and one male hummingbird, southern tier area. So this is a really good question. It sounds like, I, um, depending on how long they were in there, the young could have fledged, they might have left, but the the thing with the, the no nest in there makes me think that something got in the nest box. So I would guess it would be something like a raccoon or it could even be a squirrel. Um, if they can get to the nest box and reach inside, sometimes they will raid the nest of um, eggs, the nestlings themselves. Um, other birds that other birds that'll do that are sometimes blue jays and um, crows if they can get inside. So it can be hard for a crow to get inside of a nest box, but a blue jay might be small enough to stick its head in there and raid the nest. Um, and they will eat same kind of thing. They'll eat eggs, they'll eat nestlings sometimes. So my best guess would be a raccoon um, because the, there was no nest material in there. They probably pulled everything out. Um, but it's it's hard to say, but that that is that would be my best guess. Um, and Keith also says, oh, I had my first ever Eastern Towie as well two weeks ago. All right, look at us with our Eastern Towies. So um, really fun, really fun sighting to have. It's always exciting when something new shows up into the yard. Um, Bob, who had sent in all kinds of photos of the birds that he has, says, good morning. I've been hearing a lot of different vireos singing and singing, warbling, red-eyed, and yellow-throated are three I hear quite a bit. Here's some vireos here. Had female rose-breasted grosbeak for a quick few minutes. Lots and lots of hummingbird and oriole activity. So here's our selection here of the vireos you are most likely to see in our area. And Bob has been hearing the warbling red-eyed and yellow-throated vireos. So there's several different types that you can find. And um, if you're in kind of like middle of the woods, the red-eyed vireos are pretty prolific songsters and they'll sing all summer long. So um, you won't just hear them this time of the year, but you'll hear them late into the summer months. So that's the red-eyed vireo here that he's been getting. Um, the warbling vireo is uh, this one right here, kind of a plain just kind of non non-distinct bird. And then the yellow-throated vireo is up top. So some different, uh, some different bird activity there. We've been talking about a lot about warblers and about orioles and hummingbirds, but um, there's also vireos and thrushes and all kinds of different fun things. Um, let's see, Ducasi says, I love that song. Yeah, the wood thrush song is really, really beautiful. Karen says, good morning, had three male Orioles at the feeder yesterday, along with my first male uh, rose-breasted grosbeak. All right, so uh, Karen has been getting some of these migratory birds in her backyard still. So if you haven't had any yet, don't get discouraged because some people are just now starting to get Orioles and the rose-breasted grosbeaks. So don't be discouraged if you haven't seen uh, too much activity yet. You're, you're not alone. Some people are getting lots of activity and some people um, it's kind of been a, a slow crawl. So hopefully with the migration that we're going to be seeing um, into tomorrow, you might have some more activity than usual. So definitely keep the feeders full and uh, you know keep, keep your fingers crossed because um, it's not it's definitely not over yet. We're not um, out of migration season by any uh, you know by by any means. Um, Randy says hello, Liz. Hummingbirds are back in the city. Had three visits since Wednesday. Hummingbirds. Um, Margaret says, great pictures, Ed. Yes, Ed's um, awesome pictures of his um, wrens leaving the nest are so cute. So uh, here's what they looked like. Oh gosh, I think it was more like 10 days ago, if not more, he sent these photos in of the little, little babies. And then there are um, there, there they are just leaving the nest. So it's amazing. It really does not take them very long to grow up and to leave the nest. So for most of these songbirds, it's only like two weeks. And that's why they're eating so much insect material. And that's why it's so important to have, you know, trees and plants that support insects, because that is what these mothers the or, or fathers are feeding their baby chicks. It's going to be a lot of soft bodied insects. Like uh, I think he had a picture here of like this juicy little cricket here or caterpillars. So that is what they, uh, what they really prefer. Nothing with a really hard shell. So here's the 
the fledging Carolina runs. And Randy also says, very nice images. Thanks for sharing. And let's see, it's time says, yes, I have a mockingbird and brown thrasher come to my apartment balcony. So there's, uh, there's some more brown thrasher and mockingbird activity. And <laughs> they say, I also want an indigo bunting to show up. Yes, I agree. I do too. Um, Anne says I had an indigo bunting um, this morning at my neat treat feeder outside, uh, outside Canandaigua. Gorgeous. Okay. So when we're talking about the different kinds of seeds that the indigo bunting will eat, uh, I was mentioning, let's pull up the photo here. Um, I was mentioning that they'll eat sunflower hearts and they'll eat the millet and the Niger seed. And Anne had some eating her uh, neat treat blend, which is a mix of sunflower hearts, peanut hearts, and cracked corn. So it's, um, they're not sure what to feed them. Anne is having good luck with using her neat treat. So um, Yvonne says, just uploaded a video of Chickadee getting nesting material from one of our deck pillows. So um, for some reason, I can't download the videos from Facebook to share, but I will share this on our Facebook page once the broadcast is over. Because yeah, Yvonne sent in a great video of a chickadee raiding her pillows for nesting activity or, or for nesting material. So there's all kinds of signs of nesting activity happening. Um, so we're, if you don't have birds coming to your bird houses yet, you, you haven't missed out. Um, the season is still going strong. And yeah, they're all about the nesting material. So like my little nesting ball in my backyard, they are just like ravaging so it's it's pretty funny um let's see rhonda or it's time says hi i'm rhonda i just started bird watching and photography two months ago i have learned a lot from you any tips on where to find owls so everybody loves to photograph owls um if you depends on where you live if you're in the rochester area right now it can be kind of hit or miss um, of where to find them. In the winter, we have some short-eared owls um, that are pretty uh, pretty easy to find out in Avon, flying over open fields during uh, the, their migration season, the, the, the sawwood owls, like late March. Um, you can find them pretty often at Owl Woods out at, by Braddock Bay. That's probably the best place to go, but you never know where you might spot one. So um, people find them at Owl Woods. There's a path called the Brickyard Trail that people see. Um, they see barred owl, they see great horned owl there. So you never know where you might find one, but those are a couple good places to go to try to find them. And uh, Rob was says, we got our first male rose breasted this year. Last year, we had one female. I'm in central New Jersey. So um, in New Jersey, they're also getting rose breasted gross beaks. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if it was a better season than normal. Um, because we had that picture from Tammy where she had six at one time. So you never know what, how many you'll see. And it makes you wonder when you're not watching your feeders, what's happening. Uh, when, when you're not looking, um, it's time also says, will I continue to see migrating birds in Southeast Tennessee? Okay. So you're not in the upstate New York area. So I'm not super sure where you could to answer your question earlier about owls, not totally sure where you can go there to see them. But if you go onto the eBird website or if you use the eBird app, this is no matter where you are. So if you're on vacation, this is another good tip. Um, you can pull up the eBird app and click, I think it's explore, and it will show you all the different birding areas or places people have logged birds in that area. And it'll show you the species you can expect to see. So. It's a pretty good resource. So they've made some really nice updates to that app. So let's see if we pull up our migration map and anybody can access this. This is called, this is from a website called BirdCast. Um, so you're asking if you'll continue to see migrating birds in Southeast Tennessee. I would say so. Um, yeah, it, it looks, it looks like it. In uh, Tennessee, there's definitely still some migrating uh, birds flowing through. So yeah, pretty strong. Um, into Tennessee. So yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. You're still in the thick of it. And Ed is on, who is the proud father of the Carolina Wrens. And he says, our Carolina Wrens went from egg to fledge in about 13 days. Amazing. Okay. So yeah, it hadn't been very long since he sent in those photos of the little babies. I was trying to remember how long it had been. Um, it seems like 
it must have been longer ago that it you know that it, they don't take they don't leave that quickly but they do pretty pretty incredible so they went from eggs to the little nestlings here uh, to leaving in 13 days pretty pretty incredible so um, it's time also says, thanks. I don't have the eBird app. eBird is awesome. So um, there's a couple apps that we recommend or we talk about quite often. Uh, one of them is the Merlin app. And that's the one I was referencing for if you're hearing birds and you're not sure what they are. Um, they have a new feature now that you can listen. It'll listen to the birds that are around you and tell you what they are. It'll also identify them if you have a photo. Um, it can be hit or miss just like anything. Um, but that's a really good resource. And then as far as the eBird app goes, it will tell you uh, where you can go locally to see some different birds. And I believe, yes, if you log in or if you, you pull up the app, um, you can click, there's a little button that says explore and it'll pull up different areas around you where you can go bird watching. So it's great because say you're on vacation. So I don't know if you can see this. I just clicked explore. And there's all these little pinpoints <laughs> and then the red ones are where people have um, been reporting lots of things recently so um, this is great if you're traveling and you want to spend a little time birding this is an, uh, an awesome resource so um speaking of gardening and i was mentioning we have a plant sale going on today at the store at the birdhouse um, Rob was says our yard attracts so many birds since we started growing native plants and letting weeds grow. I should send you some photos. Yeah, I would love to see photos. If there's certain things that seem to be attracting the birds, we love to know little tips like that. Um, as far as hummingbird plants go, I've had good luck with like cardinal flower. Um, that seems to be their absolute favorite. And the bee bombs starting to come up in the garden right now. So um, hopefully that'll bring in some of the birds this uh, this year. So it looks like that's everybody's comments and questions. Thank you guys for sending in so many photos. There's been some exciting activity. We'll be back on Tuesday with another broadcast. And until then, have a great weekend and uh, happy birding. Bye-bye, everybody.